Welcome to the top 12 highlights from Chapter 14. I'm Mr. Rodman, here to take you through the judicial branch. Let's start it off by talking about the structure of the court. First of all, they are insulated from public opinion. That means the executive branch and the legislative branch can duke it out over political matters uh, and political questions, but the judicial branch doesn't really take a, a whole lot of part in that. Uh, they really try and base what they are doing on the Constitution and constitutional law. Uh, one of the things you will hear a lot of justices say in their memoirs, uh, in their autobiographies and so forth, is that uh, for the most part, uh, most of the time, they tend to be of unanimous consent in terms of their decisions. Um, it's only on, a, in most cases, social issues uh, that they, they tend to, or, or economic ones, um, that they tend to uh, tend to sway. More of the social aspect. Uh, even on economic, sometimes they tend to agree. But at any rate, uh, judicial review uh, set a precedent uh, under the, the Marshall Court under uh, with Marbury versus Madison, 1803. Uh, the whole idea there was to determine the constitutionality of laws, acts, and orders. Um, does it go against the Constitution? Is it unconstitutional? Or does it align with the Constitution uh, and therefore is permissible or constitutional under uh, the U.S. Constitution? Uh, the uh, 1787 document that basically governs uh, all uh, all laws, whether they're not whether or not they're constitutional. So uh, the court is looking at that based on uh, the Constitution and its amendments. And uh, the whole idea here is there is a dual court system. Uh, there's a federal court system in which you can file briefs and and uh, appeal for writ of certiorari in terms of having your case seen by an appellate court or the Supreme Court. And then you have state courts uh, that handle most of the, the types of cases that uh, people would see on a daily basis, criminal and civil cases that kind of move up um, through the district courts, or excuse me, through the state courts. It is an adversarial system. There are two sides arguing. Uh, in criminal cases, we've got the, the, uh, the people or the state uh, or the prosecution uh, that is basically uh, Filing some type of uh, some type of accusation against a citizen or a group of citizens uh, for something that they have done to violate uh, the laws under the Constitution, and then uh, we have the defendants uh, who basically are are the accused. And in civil and criminal cases, uh, they are defendants. Uh, as I mentioned, the prosecution or the people uh, in in criminal cases, in civil cases, they would be plaintiffs. Uh, but it is an adversarial system in that uh, you can. Uh, you have an opportunity to argue the law uh, over over the uh, the uh, the matter and uh, and do it in front of an arbiter, in front of a judge, someone who, uh, or for that matter, a jury of your peers, uh, to determine your guilt or innocence, or determine whether uh, you are on the right side of the law or your opponent in this uh, adversarial system is. So we have the trial courts and the appellate courts. So trial courts are typically these courts of original jurisdiction. Uh, they're the ones where the, the case originates, and they're determining guilt or innocence, uh, either guilty or not guilty. Um, and then based on that, if you lose the case, uh, you would be the one appealing. Um, and uh, you would appeal that to an appellate court or a circuit court on the federal on the federal level. And if you're in an appeals court that is hearing the case, in the appellate or the circuit court uh, that is hearing the case and you lose, then you can appeal it to the Supreme Court. But just keep in mind, and we'll talk about this a little later, but just keep in mind that most of the cases that are appealed are not heard. Now, civil versus criminal, remember I said uh, civil is this idea of, of between people or groups uh, that they're having an agreement. Maybe it's a contractual matter or divorce proceeding. Uh, or a, a property a dispute, um, and then criminal is basically a crime against the state. So it's the people versus you, you know, the state of Maryland versus uh, an individual, um, and the idea there is you have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and uh, and in many cases a jury of your peers making that decision. Now there is something called a plea bargain, which is you uh, agree to a lesser charge, uh, but you uh, plead guilty as a result of that plea bargain. The idea is the plea is part of the bargain, uh, and the plea here would be guilt uh, in exchange for either a lighter punishment or you're um, basically uh, a witness and you're um, going to testify um, uh, against someone else who you saw do something worse or something like that. So that's traditionally where we'd see a, a plea bargain. Um, the uh, the lead justice, uh, excuse me, the lead prosecutor uh, for the United States government in the Department of Justice would be the U.S. Attorney General. Uh, and this is Jeff Sessions um, under the Trump administration. There are also 94 U.S. attorneys or district attorneys, uh, as they're sometimes called, uh, throughout the country.
country, and they are uh, looking at cases, uh, again, uh, the Attorney General is following whatever the policy agenda is of the President uh, in terms of uh, in, in ensuring justice across the country. And these 94 U.S. attorneys and their staffs would also uh, be working with uh, Attorney General Sessions in order to carry that out. Now, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the Solicitor General who is essentially uh, the if – we, if the Attorney General is the prosecutor, then the Solicitor General is essentially the defense. Um, and so they uh, – Traditionally, will um, will represent the excuse me the U.S. government uh, in front of the Supreme Court. So, anytime there's a, a matter of, of litigation uh, that comes before uh, the court, the Solicitor General speaks on behalf of the U.S. government. Now, sometimes uh, they're not a party in the case; it's not the U.S. government, uh, but maybe they want the U.S. government to weigh in on on uh, this particular issue in terms of the legality or uh, the the law and order types of aspects. Uh, so the Solicitor General does weigh in on those sorts of things. And, and as you see here, approximately two-thirds uh, of all cases involve the U.S. government, which is uh, a lot of times why the Supreme Court sees the case at all. Um, in terms of the order, so we've got uh, some other types of courts at the bottom here, military courts and courts of veterans' appeals, tax courts, and so forth. And then we really get to the trial courts, uh, and in, these are in the federal courts now. So we've got the trial courts, and that would be your court of original jurisdiction where you would hear cases um, – in determining your guilt or innocence, uh, you could appeal that to the circuit courts or the appellate courts, which are the courts of appeals. Uh, and you see there we have 13 different circuits, uh, 12 regional, uh, essentially 11 regions, one D.C. circuit and one federal circuit. And then you have the Supreme Court, the, uh, the, the highest court in the land, so to speak, and, uh, and the ultimate arbiter of, of where a, a law or the question about a law would stop. Uh, so they are the, the final say in whether uh, a law is constitutional or unconstitutional. And uh, if they rule that, the, uh, that they don't want to hear the case, then the lower court ruling would stand. If they do want to hear the case, and, and um, then they can decide whether or not they would agree with the, the lower court or if they're going to over turn it. Uh, so that would be the role they play. But again, they don't do that on many cases. In the thousands of appeals that that are um, are filed with the Supreme Court, uh, uh, only uh, you know 170, 180 at most are actually uh, heard by the court each year. These are the boundaries, as I talked about with the with the circuits. You can see the uh, the federal circuit here and the D.C. circuit uh, would make up your 12th and 13th cir 13th circuits in that courts of appeals or the appellate jurisdiction um, that are that are labeled all across the country. So you can imagine that the Ninth Circuit's probably uh, going to be more liberal than the Fifth Circuit. Circuit or the uh, Sixth Circuit, for that matter, or the Eleventh, I guess. Um, but the idea there is uh, it all depends on who appoints those judges to those panels. And in many cases, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, but um, in many cases, uh, there are a lot of openings on these courts uh, in, the, in the circuit courts or the courts of appeals uh, because many times uh, it's a number of judges uh, that are serving in these appeals courts and, and usually they're, they're uh, looking at a number of cases, much more than the Supreme Court uh, handles in a, in a term. Uh, the Judiciary Act of 1789 basically is, is how the courts have been structured. Uh, Congress, remember, has this power under the Supreme Court uh, to basically uh, structure the courts, including those uh, trial courts we talked about with the 94 U.S. attorneys, as well as the Circuit Courts of Appeals, the Federal Courts of Appeals, those 13 circuits, and, uh, and then uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the only role that the Congress or the executive, excuse me, the legislative branch plays in the U.S. Supreme Court is determining the size of the court. They also do approve their budget. Uh, so you'll hear Chief Justice go before uh, John Roberts go before the um, go before the Congress every now and then and appeal for more money uh, to give uh, more better wages to the justices and the judges uh, in the uh, judicial branch because of um, the fact that they could actually make more money off the bench than on the bench, and it obviously uh, leads to a lot of really great judges leaving uh, in, for more lucrative uh, positions uh, as an attorney arguing before the court. So um, the Judiciary Act of 1789 basically established that structure uh, for the judiciary uh, the judicial branch and uh, how the courts are, are still used today. Um, 
As I mentioned, very few cases make it to uh, the Supreme Court in terms of them granting what we call writ of certiorari or uh, the granting to uh, show me the documents, we will hear the case. Um, there are thousands of cases that are appealed uh, to the Supreme Court each year or to SCOTUS, and, uh, and like I said, less than 200 are usually heard. Now, appeals courts he hear cases what we call en banc, which means uh, there may be 15 judges in a circuit, but only a three-judge panel of those 15 is actually going to hear the case. So that's what we call in bank, uh, hearing an appeals uh, case in bank. Uh, and sometimes cases um, that are appealed to the Supreme Court are actually remanded uh, to the lower court, meaning that they're sent back to a circuit court or even to a district court to be either retried um, based on uh, different evidence or based on something that the uh, Supreme Court uh, deemed had either been missing or, or not uh, been, uh, proper procedures have been followed. So uh, that's an important um, piece to note here. Um, remember, the Supreme Court is looking at this in terms of constitutionality, not in terms of guilt. They're looking at it in terms of does this law or act or this action violate the Constitution? And that's really what they are focused on. So they're going to let the, uh, the appeals courts and the district courts make the decisions in terms of uh, these other factors. But constitutional law is really focused on does this violate the Constitution? Does this go against um, any types of errors or, or, or issues that were made during the trial that could have, have um, essentially jeopardized the, the fairness of the trial itself? Um, there are nine justices on the court, and I know we've talked a lot about these in class, and, and uh, the, um, the the appellate jurisdiction um, in terms of the uh, what the cases uh, will go up from appellate courts to the Supreme Court. Congress does determine that. Otherwise, um, the uh, the Supreme Court basically chooses their docket. They choose what uh, what cases they're going to hear each term. Uh, they're going to schedule all of that, and uh, they'll determine uh, what cases, like I said, they either issue stare decisis, let the lower decision stand, or um, or they will agree to hear the case, granting writ of certiorari. Uh, senatorial courtesy is the concept that uh, a president, now this is not Supreme Court nominees, but this is circuit court level. If the uh, president is of the same party as senators from that particular state or that particular circuit, uh, the president will uh, consult with them on those nominations to the circuit courts. Uh, that's what we call senatorial courtesy. Uh, they will talk with them uh, in terms of, or even get suggestions in some cases uh, from them in terms of, uh, who would be good uh, to name to the circuit court here? And um, we saw um, we saw President Trump reach out to many different interest groups and senators and so forth in looking for feedback on his Supreme Court nominee. And uh, and we'd see the same thing. Um, and and that's not traditionally done with Supreme Court nominees, uh, but but it's e even more so on the circuit court level or the district court level when the president has the opportunity to make those nominations. Um, yes, the nomination process for the Supreme Court is highly political, as you can imagine, and this year, uh, even more so with uh, Justice Scalia having passed this past year and uh, the, the controversy surrounding Merrick Garland uh, being appointed by President Obama but not being, uh, not give, being given a hearing uh, by the Republican Senate. So uh, it is highly political, and I'm sure we'll see all kinds of, of things uh, happening with, uh, the, um, with the Senate hearings uh, when Neil Gorsuch is a called in before the Judiciary Committee in the Senate uh, for that purpose. Uh, the American Bar Association will issue ratings on the candidates and their qualifications. Many of them actually have uh, standing as a Supreme Court lawyer. They can actually argue before the court. Uh, John Roberts was one of those before he was named a district judge. Uh, he, had, he had argued cases before the court. And then interest groups obviously are going to try and influence uh, this as well as uh, all kinds of, of different people from uh, members of his own party uh, to the, uh, people in um, people in different uh, states and districts um, and party leaders and and uh, everybody's going to try and influence uh, the president in terms of those nominations and not just to the Supreme Court but also to those circuit courts and district courts as I mentioned now the Senate Judiciary Committee is the committee that basically uh, deals with this uh, there is a Judiciary Committee in the House but they do not deal with this because remember advice and consent is only in the Senate um, 
There is the possibility of filibuster, but uh, the Democrats uh, back in 2010, 2011 actually uh, changed the rules on the filibuster because remember it's not an enumerated power in the Constitution. It's a part of Senate rules, and uh, they removed uh, the filibuster of having to have 60 votes out of 100 uh, for a nominee uh, to move forward uh, down to a, a majority, so essentially 51 votes um, for everything but the Supreme Court. So we'll see with the uh, Gorsuch hearings how that how that breaks down, but um, I have a feeling there probably will be a filibuster in our future. Uh, let's talk about judicial activism versus restraint here for a second. Remember, the activist approach is the idea that the Constitution is a living document. It's changing over time. It's got loose construction, and uh, we're we're having to look at it in terms of what the founders would have done if they had lived in our time period and what was going on right now. Uh, judicial restraint is the exact opposite of that. They they look at it in term to, in terms of a strict constructionist approach. Strictly, what does the Constitution say? What did the founders and framers mean by it when they wrote it back in seven and ratified it back in 1787? That's uh, the biggest difference between judicial activism, kind of looking at the the living, breathing document that it is, and uh, judicial restraint, the idea of let's look at the text in terms of how it was intended. And these are very two very different judicial philosophies. Judicial activism tends tends to be more of the liberal approach. Judicial restraint tends to be more of the conservative approach. And landmark cases, uh, and we'll talk more about these in civil rights and civil liberties, but landmark cases abound in terms of this judicial activist um, and judicial restraint approach uh, with liberals lining up uh, along the activist side and uh, and conservatives on the restraint. Griswold v. Connecticut, the idea of establishing a, a, a right to privacy through the first, fourth, ninth, and fourteenth amendments, uh, looking at this in terms of uh, a right to privacy, to, to uh, purchase contraceptives and make a decision based on that as a family. Um, in 1965, the court agreed uh, that the Connecticut law uh, violated the right to privacy and it basically established that. Without that right to privacy, Roe v. Wade never would have taken place because uh, Roe basically built on that precedent. Remember, there's that term again, precedent, the idea that there is a, an established uh, type of um, decision that was passed in in, in previous cases that allows us to uh, use as historical evidence uh, for why this case uh, should be decided in a certain way. So uh, that is very important, and as you know with the uh, mock Supreme Court case, uh, we looked all, all at precedent in terms of what types of, of past rulings would help the, the justices make decisions in the here and now. Um, and another uh, great example of this is Brown versus Board of Education, uh, looking at 1954. The separate but equal law, they, they, um, they looked at 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, and said separate but equal is constitutional. But that was 58 years ago, and it took 58 years for them to come up with a unanimous ruling, basically saying that, uh, that the uh, segregation in schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And, uh, and the Brown decision, uh, as I said, was unanimous. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, the use of the Equal Protection Clause with this case that we've done in class uh, with Trinity Lutheran Church versus uh, Pauley, the Missouri uh, Department and natural resources, because they're kind of using the same argument, the idea of the violation of the Equal Protection Clause um, under the 14th Amendment uh, by, by uh, the, the DNR using the, uh, the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause and the, the concern about free exercise. So it'll be interesting to see how that, that shapes out, and I look forward to hearing, uh, looking at those, uh, those uh, transcripts and, and hearing the oral arguments on April 19th. Uh, let's talk about a litmus test for a second. This is about, um, this isn't an actual test, okay? Let's, let's just stop right there and, and say that this isn't an actual test. They don't need to have a test. Uh, they don't need to sit a candidate down and say, okay, what do you believe? There's enough documentation and evidence out there that you can figure out how a person is going to vote uh, on the court and what kind of views they hold just by looking at the past precedent, looking at the cases that they've uh, been involved with or the articles that they've written or the, the documents that they've pushed or the, um, or, or the uh, cases that they've taken on as a lawyer and what they've argued before courts. Uh, and you can get a pretty good track record of what their ideology is. Is. We know that just looking at us answering some simple questions in the, the political ideology uh, week, that, that uh, polls week that we did in answering you know five different polls uh, to determine what our ideology is. 
Um, so they can definitely look at that. So the president doesn't need to sit down with a candidate and say, OK, here's my checklist. Can, do you agree to abortion or do you agree to uh, same sex marriage or these types of things? Um, they don't need to do that. They can look at the precedent uh, and the, the historical evidence of, of their paper trail and, and determine that quite easily. But that is called a litmus test, looking at the evidence of, of their past rulings, of what they've written, of what they've talked about, with speeches that they've given. All of that gives them really good evidence as to how they might be as a, a justice on the court. Now, we know that uh, there have been justices where that's not always been the case. Um, John Paul Stevens is probably a good example uh, that was that was appointed by a Republican and ended up being a very liberal uh, justice. David Souter, a, 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 another one, uh, appointed by President George Herbert Walker Bush uh, uh, to be a conservative justice and ended up being much more moderate uh, than conservatives had hoped for. So, um, so litmus tests aren't perfect, but uh, but there definitely is uh, a much stronger look at that today than there was 20 or 30 years ago. So court procedures, looking at writ of certiorari, this is the idea of the Supreme Court saying, show us the documents, we will hear the case, okay? Uh, many of the cases that they get are informa pauperis, which means uh, that these people uh, cannot afford filing fees. Many of them are prisoners, like in the Gideon v. Rainwright case where he said he had a right to a lawyer, but he couldn't afford one. Uh, and so uh, the Supreme Court um, basically helped him uh, in, in doing those filings. And, and the Supreme Court has staff that help with this. Uh, I met them this past summer. Summer. And they, they talk all about how they work with uh, prisoners and petitioners in order to uh, make sure that the filings are appropriate and, and, um, and align with uh, what, what the court needs from them in order to uh, grant writ of certiorari. So uh, they take that very seriously because in some cases this may be the prisoner's only chance uh, at, at being heard by the court. And in Gideon's case, uh, the lower court had basically locked him away and thrown away the key. Uh, and Informal Pauperis definitely helped him in uh, getting his writ of certiorari, certiorari heard by the court. So rule of four is the idea that four of the nine justices have to grant cert uh, or granting writ of certiorari. So if they don't, uh, then they're not going to hear the case. And that's where um, we will see that the uh, the justices will decide, and there only need to be four of them, not five, but four of them to hear the case. Many of them are constitutional uh, issues, they, either violations of the Constitution or some type of federal law uh, that has been violated. Um, the, uh, the idea of a circuit conflict, maybe the Ninth Circuit, uh, uh, hears the case and says it's unconstitutional, and another circuit says, no, it actually is constitutional. So there's a circuit conflict. In many cases uh, that the Supreme Court hears, it's because of that circuit conflict. Uh, briefs are what they file uh, in terms of uh, what you were reading in the Trinity uh, Lutheran uh, v. Pauli case. Uh, the briefs were filed uh, by both sides. Petitioner and respondent both filed briefs. Then there are uh, amicus briefs, the amicus curiae briefs, or the amici, uh, that are filed as friends of the court. Court. They're lobbying the court and providing additional evidence on behalf of one side or the other. Oral arguments are what we've been doing this week in, in looking at uh, 30 minutes for each side. All the justices can interrupt at any time with questions, and you're basically on the spot. Uh, and, and as uh, the lawyers for petitioners and respondents will tell you from class, uh, that's not an easy job. That's not a very easy feat, and you've got to be ready for anything. So um, kudos and, and a, a major applause for everybody who's done that this week because you uh, You've done a really great job. So uh, remember that justices also, when, when they sit in conference every couple of weeks, uh, remember that calendar I showed you with the green box, uh, Every couple of Fridays, they will sit in conference, and actually tomorrow is one of the days when the, the real Supreme Court sits in conference, and um, they will basically um, use questions to lobby each other uh, in, in talking uh, about this, and many of them do it from the bench. Uh, so many of them will try and ask leading questions uh, to try and get their point out there. So they'll say, well, you know, do you really believe this, or, or well, well, isn't it more like this? And what they're trying to do is trying to convince others on the court uh, to see their point. Of view. And so you, many times you can listen to oral arguments and see um, a justice trying to convince another justice on the court uh, why they should uh, think about it in this light as opposed to uh, uh, the way they, they may have thought about it coming into the case. Um, so in conference, uh, they'll decide on, on the, the, um, 
They'll decide on the ruling. They'll also decide on who is going to uh, write the opinion. Uh, the majority opinion obviously would be for the majority of the court. Uh, the concurring opinion, maybe you're, you're agreeing with the majority but for different reasons. And then the dissenting opinion, usually by uh, the most senior justice who's on the dissenting side uh, in terms of those cases. They will write those, all of this being held very top secret until it's released and all of them being released by the end of June. Again, stare decisis, the idea let the decision stand, uh, and many of the cases uh, are, are not heard, so stare decisis is, is basically uh, implemented in many cases besides um, besides the, the 200 or so that you, that we hear. Uh, here's the Friday morning meeting and conference. I, I kind of already talked about this, but um, remember the Solicitor General is arguing uh, if, the, if the U.S. is party to a case or if the Justice Department um, – uh, request that the Solicitor General is is allowed to argue, and again, uh, they would get additional time for that. Um, some people refer to uh, the Solicitor General as the 10th justice on the court. I've read many uh, autobiographies in which uh, the justices such as uh, Scalia or um, uh, Ginsburg actually argue that, that they don't like that uh, premise, that they're really not um, the tenth justice. They really are just giving perspective from the U.S. government. Uh, so it is a different perspective. So let's talk about the Friday morning meeting for a second. So in conference, all of the justices meet in their private conference room. Uh, nobody else is in there but them. The the least senior justice takes the notes and answers the door, the out the the inside door and the outside door. Um, if the uh, chief justice is in the majority, then the chief, John Roberts, would write the decision. If not, uh, then they would again decide it. They would decide who is going to write it, and usually it's the most senior justice on that particular side. And again, they're going to announce that uh, at the, by the end of the term, which is usually in late June. So let's talk about checks on the power of the Supreme Court because this is kind of where we finish it up. Uh, the whole idea here is that, um, as we've talked about with every branch and the bureaucracy up to this point, they have limits. They have uh, checks and balances on their separation of power, and uh, and the Supreme Court is no different than that. So Congress can reject nominees. Uh, just because they're appointed by the president doesn't mean they're going to be named to the court, um, and Merrick Garland is probably a good example of that. Uh, they, the Congress can also alter the jurisdiction of of those courts in terms of what they hear and what appellate courts hear uh, in those cases. Um, now, Congress t has tended to stay out of that for the most part, but they have threatened to do that in some cases. Uh, Congress can also change the number of the justices on the court. From nine, uh, FDR back uh, during the Great Depression wanted to um, wanted to expand it to 15 in order to uh, get to pack the court with New Deal, pro-New Deal um, advocates. Uh, it never happened uh, because the president doesn't do that. It's Congress, uh, and Congress never took that up. But Congress can also impeach justi justices, and they have on this on the circuit level uh, have. Um, uh, impeached them in the House and uh, tried them in the Senate and removed, uh, uh, what, four of nine, uh, four or five of nine justices, um, or excuse me, judges uh, on the uh, circuit courts of appeals and uh, other federal judges across the country, uh, mainly for corruption or bribery and that sort of thing. Congress can also amend the Constitution to overturn a court's decision. If they don't like it, uh, they can pass a constitutional amendment and then send it on to the states. And if the states agree and ratify it, then um, – it will essentially have overturned the court's decision. Now, the president has checks on the, the Supreme Court as well and, and the judicial branch. Uh, the president nominates the judges. The president can also use the bully pulpit in order to, uh, in order to uh, generate different types of approval or disapproval of, of the decisions that the Supreme Court makes uh, or or um, uh, or the uh, type of nominees that are being accepted. Uh, so the president can get up there and talk before the media and, and talk uh, – and President uh, Obama did this during the State of the Union address and talked about uh, – this is a Citizens United case uh, right in front of the Supreme Court, many of which were sitting there. Um, and, and as a result, a couple of them actually didn't come back uh, to the State of the Union because of it uh, in, in, in later years. Uh, but uh, the president has uh, that power of the bully pulpit. The president also has the power uh, to uh, enforce decisions or not. Uh, Andrew Jackson was not very fond of the court not ruling in his favor, and he said, okay, there's your decision. Now let them enforce it uh, because that's not their role, so good luck, and, and they don't have the money or the resources to do it. So what other limits does the Supreme Court have? Well, they can't initiate cases. Uh, they're only looking at cases that are bubbling up from the 
the district courts and from the appellate courts. So they have to wait for the right case that they're interested in to come along. It's not like they can go out and just um, and make a case uh, uh, to come about. Now, um, they don't have enforcement powers, as I mentioned in the Andrew Jackson case, and, and many times uh, they don't follow the court of public opinion uh, because, again, they're insulated from public opinion and the political pressures of it. Uh, they do a lot of issuing stare decisis, let the lower decision stand, uh, and especially in in uh, prior court rulings from the Supreme Court on down. Uh, and the limits uh, that they have are in Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution in terms of what they can and kind of cannot do. Uh, but that gives the Supreme Court a lot of leeway in terms of um, in terms of what cases they can hear. And again, they get thousands of appeals for writ of certiorari each year. And uh, in granting only you know 180 or so, uh, they, they really try and focus on the cases uh, that can answer constitutional questions or uh, via violations of federal law under the Constitution. That's it. That's the top 12 highlights from Chapter 14. I hope you found this helpful. And good luck on the quiz coming up and the test as well. Live the five.